Hey Robot Makers, how you doing? Hope you're having a good day so far. So, do you want to know how to make your own ultrasonic radar robot that can see with sound? Then this is the show for you. So let's dive straight in. My name's Kevin. Come with me as we build robots, bring them to life with code, and have a whole load of fun along the way. Okay, let's get over to our keynote, and we can make a start. So I'm going to do this slightly differently today. Um, I normally record my shows all in one go and it's like just over an hour long for the probably the main content. And uh, I recently had a, a chat with um, explainingcomputers.com and Chris Barnett and um, he was saying this is probably harming my channel. So what I'm going to try and do is um, is every 15 minutes I'm just going to pause and we're going to basically have an edit point there. So Alex is going to start the, uh, the stopwatch and we're going to make sure that uh, we get around about the 15 minute mark. We'll just stop for a part two. I'm not going to stop this live stream, I'm going to cut it post-production. So I just wanted to sort of explain that as we go. So this is part one. Let's get to it. So the session goals, we're going to be creating an ultrasonic radar robot using a rangefinder and a servo. It's a really simple build, really loads of fun. Uh, we're going to have a look at how ultrasonic radar works. We're going to have a look at how to build a radar display. I had quite a lot of fun doing this. Um, it uses trigonometry. We're going to have a look at uh, how that works. We're going to have a quick look at the 3D design and how I recycled some of my existing designs uh, to make this one nice and simple to do. And we'll have a look at the electronics, how to wire this up. And of course, we're going to have a look at the code and have a live demo too and at the end of the show we'll have a live Q&A where we can have a chat and kind of hang out for a little bit okay so let's get over to uh, the ultrasonic radar and how this works so ultrasonic rangefinder is mounted to a servo and you can see on the diagram there it's then rotating around that pivot point so that the ultrasonic rangefinder is sweeping around 180 degrees and uh, it can take a reading every single degree and store that reading or it can uh, you know it can build up a picture of what it can see in front of it 
So what we're also going to do is output that to a radar display. So I've got some little displays. I love these uh, these tiny little displays. I'm going to mount one of these to the back of the robot uh, in the in the full robot when we've finished the project. So currently I've just got this on my desk using a Pico Explorer base from Pimeroni uh, just to sort of test out how this will work. So yes, later the plan for the whole project. This is like I said, part one of a few parts that are going to be coming. We are going to feed all these readings that we take in a sweep round. We're going to feed that into a machine learning algorithm and we're going to build up some um, a, a, an artificial intelligent model, an MM model that can detect objects in front of it. So, for example, what I'm thinking is an object that's round like this has got a different profile than, say, a corner edge. So we're going to get it to train so it'll learn certain objects um, and we can put in lots of different things, classify them, tag them and we can build it up. And then we can run the neural network model on MicroPython device on a Pico, which is crazy. So we're going to try and do that. That's what we're going to do in the fullness of time. But today it's about how do we just make the mechanical uh, range finder sweep round and take some readings. So there's a slightly different view of it. You can see there the uh, there's a servo horn just mounted on the back there that pokes through. And uh, I've got one part I made earlier. This was the sort of first prototype, even got the blue tack on it still. And uh, yeah, the servo would sort of fit into there and um, the other part would sit on top, the, the servo horn would sit on top and then the range finder would just push into that. So that's how, that's how it physically works. And you can see there it's made up of quite a few different parts. We'll have a look at those slightly later on in the show. So the radar display, let's have a look and see how this actually works, shall we? So it's all about triangles. We're going to be using a soccer toe, if you remember that from high school, uh, to work out some some angles and some lengths of things. So what, we, what we're shooting for is we want the traditional kind of radar display. So we want it to sweep around 180 degree arc ideally in green on a black background with a bit of a, a fade as it uh, sweeps round. We'll see how we can achieve that. And any objects that are placed in front of the rangefinder will display on the scan proportionate to the length of the sweep. So we can factor that in. Um, so the display will be housed on the back of the robot. So currently as it stands at the moment, I've not built that part. The display and the, the robot are slightly separate, but we will get that in the uh, fullness of time. I've chosen to use Pico Graphics, which is a really great uh, graphics library, particularly for drawing vector graphics. Uh, and this has been invented by Pimroni. Now, there are some um, native graphics uh, functionality within MicroPython. There is a frame buffer um, library that you can use, and that has things like the, the line um, drawing thing, which we're going to use here. But I'm using Pico Graphics, which means I've used the Pimroni MicroPython. So if you're using Thony, you can actually choose to install that. Uh, if you just hit the uh, the reset, the, the boot select button, when you're powering up your Pico, you can then select to install um, Pimroni MicroPython. So Pico Graphics has this line primitive, and the way that it works is it takes four different um, integers. It takes an X1, a Y1, an X2, and a Y2. That should sit at the bottom there, it says Y1, it should say Y2. Uh, and then it draws a line between those two points. So the X1, Y1 is the sort of start point in the line that can be anywhere on the on the actual display it doesn't have to be top top left it can be anywhere the line algorithm will figure out how to draw that but you do need to have those so if you remember on your computer graphics x is the sort of across y is the down so we need a start and end position so the display itself i'm using these really nice um 20 uh, 240 by 240 color displays they use this uh, st 7789v display driver and that's actually built into the pico explorer base unit so really nice and easy to sort of use this without having to do much um, configuration like i said it's got 240 by 240 pixels it's square it's got this um, in-plane switching display ips display which means it's got a really nice viewing angle so depending where you are you can sort of see it from any angle it uses the spi bus as well just to make it really easy to uh, plug in from a wiring perspective you just need four wires and um, i'm also looking to put the breakout version of this on the back of the robot so pin run you do a breakout version which means it's just got like it's got five uh, header pins i think one of them's probably not used or it might be uh um, the brightness I think you can adjust on one of the pins of the CS pin so um, yeah that's what we're going to be using in the sort of long term so if we're going to build along this I'll, I'll put a full bill of materials on the site when I've uh, finished building this that's what we're shooting for so how do we draw the sweep so I was thinking about this um, how do you how do you draw an arc in fact on computer graphics 
Well, what we need to do is we, we know the length of the line that we're going to draw because we can start out and just say if our, if our display is like 240 wide, let's split that in half. So it's, um, what's that, 120. Let's give ourselves a little bit of breathing room so the line will be 100 pixels long. So that's, we know the length of the line. We know the angle of the line that we're going to draw as well. So we know those two things already. So we want to draw this series of lines, one for each of the 180 degree sweeps that we're going to make. So to draw the line, we need to solve these triangles and find the X1 and Y1 positions, because we always know the X2 and Y2 positions. I've got that spelling mistake down there as well, because that's in the middle of the bottom of the display, so it can sweep round completely. So we can use this uh, line once we've found and we've solved our, our triangle, we can then use it to do the X1, y1 x2 y2 and then draw the line and we can choose what color we want the line to be and so on so drawing the sweep this is what we need to figure out we need to solve the triangle to figure out the positions of x1 y1 we know what x2 y2 is like i said it's the uh, it's the middle bottom of the screen so y2 is the bottom of the screen so whatever the height is it's the very bottom of that um, so 240 or 239 if we're starting at zero which display usually do and the middle of the display is whatever the width of the display is. And we can actually grab that using Pico graphics. You can just say get bounds to get the actual width of the display, just in case you're using a different size display. And then you can basically just say slice that in two, divide by two uh, to get the X2 position. And then we know the length of side C on our triangle there, well, that angle there. We know side C, that's the 100 pixels. Uh, and really, the, when we're doing algebra, we just need to know it's 100 something. We don't really, really care it's pixels at that point. We know the angle A because angle A is the angle we're currently sweeping at. We'll have a little function that goes through and counts 180 degrees and passes that through. And then we, what, we also know that uh, C is always going to be a right angle. It's always going to be 90 degrees. So if we know A and we know C, we can work out what B is because it's simply 180 minus A plus C and that will give us our uh, B angle. And because we know that, we can then work out the rest of the length of the sides because we know the angles and we know the length of one side. So we can use a bit of trigonometry to do that. And we'll do that on the next screen. So we know the length of side C of the triangle. We know angle A and angle C. Uh, we need to find the length of the side A and the lowercase a there to get the Y1. So it's the height from the bottom of the screen up and also the length of the side B. Oh, well, it's actually the middle of the screen minus B, uh, lowercase b. Once we know those two things, we can then draw our line. Cool. I had to figure this out all by myself. <laughs> so this is an AAS triangle, an angle, angle, side triangle. And if we uh, if we know what kind of triangle we're trying to solve, we know which kind of algorithm to use to solve that. So like I said, to find angle B, which is in orange there, we simply say 180, which is the, if you remember from trigonometry, 180 is how many angle, how many degrees you have in a, in a triangle. And if we know A and C added together, minus 180 will get whatever B is. So that's a nice easy one there. And then to work out sides A and sides B, we just need to do a little bit of trigonometry using sin. So if you remember, you have like tan, cosine and sin, and we're basically just going to use sin to work out the length there. So the actual MicroPython code is this piece down here. So we need to actually uh, cast it, as they say, into an integer. So in case we divide stuff, it ends up being like a floating point number. That's not really good for our display. We want pixels, so we want an absolute number. So casting it as an integer will make sure it, it is a whole number. And then we say C times by sin, and then the sin function actually works in radians. So that's actually 360 degrees. We need to get rid of that and just make it into 180. So we can just use the uh, radians function to do that bit for us. So that's all those brackets for there. Capital A is just the, uh, the, the main angle that we're going to pass in. Uh, we want to find out what uh, A and B are. We divide that by sin and then radians C, which is the other angle, which we know is 90 degrees. And then we'll get the length of A, which means we can figure out what our x1 uh, sorry our y1 position is and if we figure out b we can figure out what our uh, x1 position is and then draw our line so that's what we're going to do uh, so how are we doing on time there i've got another couple of minutes yet haven't we so let's have a dive into the 3d design so the chassis is actually the explorer base so i've got my old explorer robot here this is one i built earlier and this chassis that i've got here is a really good um I designed it to be like this. It's a really good use 
case for any kind of robot you want to build. All you need to specify is what where the holes are. So this particular one was for um, a Pico Explorer hat uh, pack hat hat even because it's got a Raspberry Pi Zero underneath, and this one had the rangefinder sort of sandwiched between two things. And there was even a, a, a space there for uh, a Raspberry Pi camera as well if you wanted to use that on this particular one and this one had a little rangefinder well it's an ultra so uh, it's an infrared um, line sensor unit um, on that particular one this is an old model and what i've done is i've basically just taken the the measurements of this and i've just repurposed them for my new robot and it's really simple to to put together i'll show you the uh, the blueprint in a second on the next screen so you can create these yourself and it's three millimeters thick and that seems to be a really good thickness it doesn't bend it's really solid and it's really quick to print um, doesn't take very long at all so it's solid doesn't bend very easy to attach your motors to as well so um, i'll show you that uh, in a second underneath i've got some n20 motors and i've got a little motor holder that just screws into place with two m3 screws and nuts and we'll have a look at some captive nuts as well on one of the uh, the diagrams in a second so this is the blueprint. You can see there it's 90 uh, millimeters by 70 millimeters as a rectangle in the middle. And then we've kind of got like a front and a back piece on there as well. And then there's little tabs, if you like, for um, where the wheels go. It just gives the wheels a bit of clearance away from the main body and they can sort of sit over the top of that. And it works for lots of different types of wheels. Um, so there, if you look there, we've got a five millimeter distance between that side and that side It's 8.5 sort of tall and 16 wide in the middle and then they just anchor to the very edges of that rectangle so oh, there are all the main measurements that you need to have there so the servo holder this is the uh, the piece it's a sort of shorter version of this that this one was like the full height of a, a servo so i could just test that out on the desk this one for the robot is slightly slimmer and the servo pokes through the bottom of the chassis as well so there's little space for that and it's held in place by three M3 captive nuts. There's one, there's one sort of hidden in, inside that you can't see on the uh, the model. There's one there as well. And the way that these captive nuts work, they're a really good way of securing 3D printed parts together. So you just have um, a little nut piece that goes in. So you've got a little hexagonal nut shape, and you've got the M3 uh, bolt that goes through the nut and sort of two squished together. You don't have to over tighten them. They're pretty secure, and it really holds everything in place. So I really like including these in my designs. It's a really nice way of making things easy to print because they're separate parts so yeah the servo screws in from underneath so i'm using um it's a tower pro mg 92b which is this one here it's almost the exact same dimensions as um an sg90 the sort of cheaper ones i've got a sort of slightly better quality one just because i wanted this robot to be as accurate as possible and i found on some of these cheaper sg90s they can be a little bit flaky so i thought for this particular robot i wanted a bit more accuracy so i paid a little bit more for one of these i've got a whole pack of them so works with the mg90s sg90s the ds929 mgs which i've used in other robots in the past as well as these tower pro mg92bs Okay, so next is the rangefinder holder uh, that this attaches the servo horn um, to the um, the servo horn attaches the rangefinder holder to the body and gives it that pivot point in the very middle where we need it to be. Um, what we do need to make sure though that is when, before we actually put that little screw in place, so you'll get a little, little bag like this when you uh, you buy your servos and there's a tiny little screw in there that you screw into the into the sort of spindle of the, the servo and um, that just before you do that you just need to make sure that your servo is centered and the, your rangefinder thing is pointing forward. Now I have got my desk of bits here. Just unplug that. You can see the, the time there as well, which is good. Um, what I've got in my desk here is just a little uh, servo, um, what would you call this? A servo consistency tester or something. And it basically just has a, a little knob on there and you can plug in a number of different servos, like I think three of them. You apply some power on there and then it'll just set the servo and you can just dial this so you don't have to have any other thing else connected to it you can just use this to sort of set it so there's a little button on board as well um, if you click that you can basically set it between one of three different settings so i use that to just make sure it's completely centered before i screw everything into place okay yeah 
I'm, uh, I'm just going to run two minutes over just to get this bit done, Alex, but um, thank you for that. So yes, the ultrasonic rangefinder simply just pushes into place on the back of the rangefinder holder. You don't need any glue or screws. And then you can connect up just using one of these DuPont cables. I've got one of a pack of these. Um, and depending what you've got on the other end, you might want the male to male, male to female, female to female, whatever, um, whatever works really. And you just need four of these. So you've got ground, voltage, trigger and echo. Okay, as if Alex had already planned this. <laughs> So I'll just take a break for one second. So welcome back to part two. So let's continue our ultrasonic robot uh, build and uh, let's get into the next part. So this is the electronics and wiring it up. Okay, so it's quite a simple thing to wire up. This is actually a diagram I've used on a previous robot. Um, I'm trying to think which one this would be actually. Um, it's gone off the top of my head. It's probably one of the... Uh, which one would that actually be? That would probably be... Um, it would probably be the spooky scary skeleton robot that I built for Halloween um, but it's basically the exact same wiring diagram so what we need to do the main things we need to take is the servo needs 5 volts so we're going to take that from the the V bus which is on the very top right of our Pico there this isn't a great thing to do what I'm going to do in later build of this ro robot is have a separate power supply um, for the robot and this will take um, a 5 volt supply rather than going through the Pico is what I'm trying to say. But for now, this works okay just on the bench. So we're going to take our five volts from the from the V-Bus into our servo. We're going to take one of the grounds from the Pico into our servo as well. And then we just need one signal pin. So on this particular diagram, I think I've got that down as pin, what is that, pin 15, something like that. Um, I might change that in the code later on. But we just need one pin and we just make, um, it's either on or off. No, it's not. It needs to be a pulse width modulation. So it just needs one. But I think all the pins are on a Pico are PWM. So we can basically just pick any GPIO pin that we wish for that. Then for the rangefinder, we need one of the rangefinders, which is the 3.3 volt uh, compliant ones. So these are still called HCSR04, but they usually have like a P or an L on the end. I think P for like a P or L for low power. Um, they have an extra couple of chips on the back. That's how I recognize them. If you have one of these and it doesn't seem to work, you've probably got the 5 volt version and it isn't designed to work at 3.3 volts. So um, just make sure if you are, when you're ordering them, it is a 3.3 version. They usually have like I squared C and um, SPI connectors on there as well. You'll just see some little writing on the, uh, the printed circuit board on the silk screen. So from there we need the 3.3 feed, so I'm taking that from the 3.3 feed on the Pico there, which is like the fifth pin down. We take any of the grounds, um, I could have taken another ground and had that ground over there, whichever we like. And then we just need two pins, one for trigger and one for echo. Um, so on this particular diagram I've got the trigger uh, going to pin, z uh, pin 1 and the echo going to pin 0. I think on my code later on I'm using GPIOs 4 and 5 for that. But um, it doesn't really matter, just as long as you know which you're using there. I always think about, I'll have the trigger as the main one I need to think about. It's always easier to get these mixed up. Um, and that's pretty much it. We don't need anything else at this point. So later on in our robot build, we are going to be powering our wheels. And I've got a bunch of these uh, really cheap uh, H-bridges. Um, these are really, really cheap to come by. And I want to keep this robot as cheap as possible. Um, so these ones, if I can show you there, I think they're called an L298N. Um, and that's what they look like and they have they have a power in and they also have uh, another four uh, eight pins so two for each motor and uh, well, it's actually four for each motor because there's like um no two for each motor output and two for each motor input there we go um so if i've got four motors on my robot i actually need two of these so i'm going to have these in a, a mounted there's a, a tiny little mount hole there so i'm just going to 3d print apart and i designed my robot so it's got two spare uh, m3 holes where i can put apart solidly into place with all these bits and pieces so that's going to contain a screen it's going to contain the motor drivers and it's also going to contain a battery as well so that's the electronics for now for this particular part of the build and um the rangefinder code right so we looked at this on the spooky scary skeleton one but just as a quick recap um, it's quite easy to do uh, to use these rangefinders. Um, we can measure the distance by measuring how long it takes for a burst of sound to bounce off an object and return to us. So when we when we actually time how long that signal takes, we get twice the distance because it's had to bounce there and bounce back. So we have to slice it in two. 
uh, and you can see on the uh, the code on the right there so we're basically just setting up the echo and the trigger pin we can provide whichever pins we like for those um, we can then say first of all let's just reset the device so we set the trigger pin to low we wait um, two fractions of a second i think they're um, microseconds and then we then set the pin high wait five microseconds make it low and then we set two variables signal on and signal off to zero we then wait for the the echo to come back so we say set the echo pin to zero and while it's zero we count the ticks how long it takes for that signal to propagate out and then we're going to listen for how long it takes to bounce back so we say while the echo pin is one sorry while the yeah the, while the echo pin is one then signal on is ticks us so that just gives us that uh, how many microseconds we've uh, elapsed there we can then have another variable that says how what is the elapsed microseconds so it's, it's just signal on minus signal off we then can work out the uh, the duration of that it's just the elapsed time and then the distance is the elapsed time times by the speed of sound divided by two which is basically how long it took and then how long it took to come back we can then return that distance as the distance that our object in front of us is so that's how we do a ping once and return for our ultrasonic rangefinder okay so rangefinders how do they work again if you've not seen the videos that we've done in the past we can uh, cover that off and here we go this is just the, the the pins that we have on there we've got a voltage pin we've got a ground pin and then we have a, tri a trigger and an echo so i think the trigger is the uh, the speaker that sort of trumpets out like you know here's the ultrasonic blast if you point them at a microphone you can actually hear them sort of pulsing as it hits the microphone uh, and the echo is a is a microphone and that can hear the sound coming back so there's a defined pulse width that it sends out and then it listens to see how quickly that comes back and they're pretty accurate they can do um, about 150 centimeters i believe um, and um, somebody says there the uh, the labels are mixed up depends which way you're looking at them um, i'm looking at this front on so the voltage will be on the left hand side if you flip that round which is the way you normally look at it the voltage will be on the right hand side so uh, thanks steve for that one that's uh, just as you're looking at the device but you tend to look at it the other way around and there's that 3.3 volt version as well so how do um, range finders actually work so they have this ping uh, and echo thing so here's a smas robot this is how i first played with these we've got an object that's 30 centimeters away we send out our pulse and we can see the time there on the top so that's 17.64 um, milliseconds and if we divide that by two we get 8.882 milliseconds we times that by the speed of sound and we get 29.998 whatever roughly 30 centimeters away so we can figure out how far an object is just using that very simple uh, maths and a very simple device so love these they can use them in all kinds of robots now another thing i just wanted to to show when i build my robots and i put um, like a pico i tend to put them upside down against the 3d printed part so say this is my robot i'll i'll put them like that so the pins are pointing up so i can plug my dupont cables in but unless i put a hole through where i can press that reset button I would have to unscrew this to be able to hold down the uh, the boot select button while I'm putting in um, a cable if I wanted to sort of put circuit python on there or a different version of micropython if you've got python um, on your pico it doesn't matter whether it's micropython or circuit python I believe you can just do import machine machine dot bootloader brackets and it will set it into bootloader mode so I thought I'd just share that little tip because um, it's quite a useful thing to know Okay, so if you like my show, please uh, make sure you like, comment and subscribe. So like this video if you like it, like the, each uh, video in the series if you like them. Uh, drop me a comment, let me know if this is something that you're going to look at, you're going to have a play with yourself making an ultrasonic uh, radar robot. And if you've not already subscribed to the channel, which I think about 80% of people haven't yet, subscribe, costs you nothing and it really helps grow the channel. And I go live every single Sunday at 7 p.m. GMT. Um, so if you want to join me and have a bit of a live chat and hang out, then that's, you know what to do there. We've got quite a few people uh, hanging out with us today. I think we've got the highest number I've seen in quite a while. Okay, so this is uh, part three. 
So welcome back to part three of the ultrasonic. Ro uh, <laughs> Let me say that again. <laughs> welcome back to uh, part three of the radar robot, uh, and let's continue with our our series here. So we're going to have a, a demo and have a look at some code. So let me jump over. I'm just going to put it on to me for a second. I'm going to jump over to Thony, and we're going to load up um, the code. So let's just jump over here first of all. So this is the code um, I've written. So I've got three different pieces of code that I'm going to show you today. I've got the um, the range finder, which is simply that code that you, you saw on screen a minute ago. I put it into a class so we can basically just reuse this uh, many times. And we can be based by putting it as an at property uh, decorator on the top of our code. We don't need to use brackets. We can just say range finder dot distance and it will return the distance. So we can see there. And I've also used this round function, which just gets rid of all those decimal points that you sometimes get with 14 point numbers. And I basically just said, give me one decimal point. We're measuring things quite crudely. We can measure them um, in millimeters and um, or centimeters. This one returns in centimeters. That's why I'm dividing the millimeters by 10 to get the centimeters. And um, I'm also, um, I'm also rounding that up to one decimal point just because it makes sense to have it with that granularity. So they got returns in centimeters. So I've got to use that range finder function. I do need to make sure that range finder um, code is uploaded. So I need to do upload to, and then I've already got it on my Pico here. Um, so if we go to our radar code, this one is just going to make it sweep round and display on the display all the different, um, all the different readings. Um, so, let me just talk you through this. So we're importing servo. So remember, I'm using the Pimroni Pico um, MicroPython build. So it has things like the servo class built in, uh, and it also has Pico graphics built in, which we'll use in a minute. We're going to import time because we need to use the sleep function quite a bit. I'm going to import the range finder uh, object, the class that we've just uh, seen a second ago. I'm going to set my trigger pin to two and my echo pin to three. I'm going to write out all the readings that I take to a data file. And the reason that I want to do this is I'm going to train my neural network uh, over next week to recognize different objects. And to do that, I need to have a text file, a CSV file, comma separated values file with all the different readings. So one for each of the degrees that it sweeps around. I can then feed that into the neural network and say, this particular scan had a Coke can um, in front of it. And I can classify all those things. This one has a chihuahua in front of it and take a couple of hundred readings for each type of thing I want to see. And then I can feed that into the neural network and we'll have a look at how to do that in a future video. Uh, the next two things, so I've got S, which is our servo. So I'm going to start it off on being pin zero. Remember when I was saying which pins I've got this connected to, so that's GPO zero on this particular one. And I've got the range finder there. I'm just setting up the trigger pin is GPIO2 and echo pin is GPIO3. So I just need to remember that when I'm uh, plugging this in. Let me just make that adjustment on there for when we do our radar in a second. Okay, so then we're going to, I've got a function here for take reading. So I've got an array that's called readings. And I say with open data file, and we're going to um, append to this file and it's a, a binary file. So we then basically just say for I in range zero to 90. So we're going to start in the middle and we're going to go, um, which way would it be to the right perhaps? Uh, it depends which orientation the, the servo is. And then we're going to basically just loop around there 90 times. We're going to set the, the servo to whatever the current I is, which is the degree we're sweeping through. We're going to print out to the terminal what the distance of the current object is, what the angle we're currently sweeping around at, and what the count is as well. I think I use count. Um, where do I use count on there? I'm not sure what I've used that for. Um, okay, and then next is the basically going from the 90 position back all the way across to minus 90. So the way that these servos work is they have a center position, the sort of middle position. So if I say that's straight up, and then you can go minus 90 or plus 90 for the whole 180 degrees. You don't start at zero and go all the way 180. So I just need to factor that in when I'm doing my code on here. Um, so then we go all the way between 90 and minus 90, stepping minus one at a time. You can see there we don't include one to say step one thing at a time, incrementing uh, the, the for loop in steps of minus one. And then we basically sweep all the way back. I've got that sleep as 0.01 um, seconds, so it's really, really quick. 
And then I'm, after I've taken a full 180 degree sweep, I'm going to write the contents to a file. Um, so there we go, the count. That's what the count is for. The count is just to tell me how many times I've taken a reading and written it to the file. I think that's what the intention of that was. Uh, I can't see why I increment that though. So I must do that. Must do that somewhere else. Um, okay, so what we do next is we print out, wrote the data file, and then we just return the servo back to the middle position. Now, the reason I do this is I found if I try and make the servo move really quickly, particularly with these sort of high quality ones, I think they draw a bit too much power from the Pico, so it probably just pulls more than five volts or the current that's going through it is a bit more than the Pico is happy with. So it cuts out the, uh, um, and, and reboots the Pico. So what I've done is if I just move that back, it doesn't do that quick sweep back. It does this sort of gentle one. So that's what that last piece of code there does. I then got a demo one, which is just when I was trying this out, I was just getting it to sweep round and print out to the terminal. And I had another one called sweep where you could basically just say, here's the servo, here's the, um, the range finder um, and just give me some readings back from that. So the, the for loop is very, very simple. I've commented out all the other stuff there. This is where count comes in. We say for count in range one, um, range one in, in steps of two, take the readings and then um, sleep for a quarter of a second. So let's get over to our overhead camera. Let's just bring this uh, robot into view there. And what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna run this code um, I'm just going to bring it up to there and just watch the terminal and watch the robot itself. There we go. So it's sweeping round and you can see the count is currently at one. And when it goes back to the middle position, that count should go to two. Uh, I've actually got the, the loop so that it only actually takes um, one reading currently. So if we just do that to say, um, let's say count in range one to two. So let's change that to 10 and then run it again. We'll get it to do 10 sweeps. There we go. So we can see the distance there is in centimetres. So yeah, about 30 centimetres in front of my desk is um, a wall. If I put a object in front of it, like so, you can now see that some of the readings will say six point something. I'll tell you when it's pointing at it. So it's pointing out now, there you go, eight centimetres away. And we can see what the angle is as well uh, in degrees. So what you're probably looking for though is where's that nice radar thing that you've talked about? So let's have a look at that next. So you can currently see I haven't got a display on the back of my robot currently. What I have got is this uh, Pimroni Pico Explorer base. Um, so this is a really nice, I've just got some blue tech on there to keep it um, in place while we're, we're looking at it. So if I just uh, move that up, let's plug that into place there. Okay. Let me just move the microphone over here. So I just need to sort of re-plug uh, in some bits and bobs. I'm just going to have to unplug that wheel for a second. Plug that into this Pico down here. The right orientation. There we go. And let me just put that in place. And I'm also going to have to pull out our rangefinder and have this plug in from, from here instead. So let me just grab my robot and let me just make sure I've got this right. So the yellow should be the 3.3 volts. The blue should be, sorry, the green should be uh, the ground. We've got the blue as the trigger and the purple one is the echo. It's a bit of a fiddly thing to do this on camera. Let me just uh, mangle these for a second. So that's going there. What did I say the trigger was blue? That's the main one. There we go. And then the purple one is the echo and the green is the ground. Right, let me just push these into place. Okay, now you can see that I've not actually got the, uh, the servo hooked up on this Pico Explorer because there's nowhere on this to get five volts from. So I'm a bit stuck at the moment on this particular one, but we can actually try out um, our scanning thing without spinning this round, or we can spin it manually to see. So I'm just gonna point it at, at that Diet Pepsi can there. I'm gonna come back over here. And what I'm gonna do, I'm gonna load up my radar display code. I was fiddling with this before, so I'm hopefully I've not ruined it. And let me run the script and let's see what happens. 
right so you can't currently see the pico display so there we go so we've got the radar scanning so if i put something in front of the radar and what i'll do i'll zoom in a little bit as well so you can see this let's get this into position so we can see what's going on there we go so as it's taking readings if i put some things in front of it not my arm <laughs> we can see that the the range changes so there we go if i put my hand in front of it so i've got my hand in front of it now it's changing it slightly and if i remove my hand you can see there that the scan has changed color so the radar is working what i haven't got working both together just because i've run out of pins and and power is the actual sweep of the servo and the radar working in unison but it's very simple to do that i have got the code to do that in fact this code is actually supplying the correct um, instructions to have the radar work so we can have a look at the code of that and just see how different it is so let me just stop that from running for a second uh, i did say this is a multi-part video so we will come back to this and we'll have all the parts working i've ordered the um the little display which is the exact same display that we've got here but as a breakout garden display we're going to have that on the back of the robot so we can see the scan on the robot and it'll be self-powered okay so let's have a look at the code uh, let's go to this view and let's have a look how this is actually working so I'm importing Pico Graphics first of all. Like I said, I'm using the Pimroni Pico Graphics library um, and the version of MicroPython. Their batteries included MicroPython. So let me just show you how we can do that. If I go down here and I type um, import machine and I do machine.bootloader like so, it'll put the the, you can see there it's dropped out and it can't connect to the uh, to the Pico. If I click on here and I go to configure interpreter, um, we can now flash the, the firmware by going to install and it recognizes there. We can say what MicroPython variant do we want? And we can select this 29 different variants of this. And I want the Pimroni. Let me find it. I think it's down. There we go. Pimroni, Pico, it's either a Pico or Pico W, whichever you've got. I've got the Pico W H and version 19. So I can click on install. It'll then install the software and we can uh, copy our rangefinder pi to that and then start again. So if we wanted to load CircuitPython, we could just use the exact same method. And I believe it works exactly the same whether you have a Mac, PC or Linux. So let's just click OK on that. I'll click down on the bottom here and yeah we're using Raspberry Pi Pico and using MicroPython so there we go because I've not flashed the the RAM it can actually still see in its file system that that rangefinder.py is still there and there's even like that readings.csv I'm not sure if, yeah there we go got a couple of readings that we took uh, and we've been building up so it'll keep adding to that if I run that uh, radar.py so let's go back to our radar display so we're importing the Pico graphics and I can even tell it what kind of display because it's a, a, a Pico, um, because it's a Pimroni uh, product, they've already classified all their different displays uh, as a constant there. So display Pico Explorer, uh, we can import that and then we can set it up down here by saying display equals Pico graphics, Pico display Pico Explorer. And we can even set the rotation of the screen. So depending how we have our, our screen mounted we can very simply just change the rotation degrees in there like 90 270 180 and it'll be the correct orientation for however we have that mounted um, some of the things we have in here so we have um, I, I use gc which is the garbage collection uh, this is simply because we're doing some stuff with memory we're putting things into arrays and because we're doing that many times i thought let's just include the garbage collection um, thing in there we we'll probably run that a few times excuse me, further down in our code. Uh, we, we're using the math library, so we're bringing in sin and radians, we're bringing in time and sleep, we're bringing in our range finder library that we created earlier, uh, we're bringing in machine and pin, and the servo library as well, which is a, a Pimroni um, MicroPython. I included the motor code there, but we don't actually use it. That was me trying to hack the, uh, the Pico Explorer to get five volts, because I'm sure the motor's a five volts output, um, but that didn't work, so ignore that you can basically just ignore these four lines of code there um, then the trigger we're just setting the trigger on the echo pins like we did before we're setting s and r to be the servo on gpio zero we're setting up the rangefinder to have the trigger and echo pins 
now the display we're, we're creating a new object called a display using pico graphics using the pico explorer display we can get the width and the height of the display by doing display.getBounds. The next section here, uh, we need to create something called a pen when we use Pico Graphics. Whatever the current pen color is, when you do a graphics uh, instruction, like a line, whatever the current color is, that's what the pen will draw. So I've set up five different colors there, really dark green. So this is red, the red are so it's RGB values. The red is zero, the green is 64, the blue is zero. Dark green is 128 for the green, everything else is zero. Green is 255, so the highest green value. Light green is, that's white at the moment. I think I tried the, having that as like 128 and 128. So it's like a really washed out white color. And black is basically just everything is zero. So then to create a pen, we we bring in the current display object because we need to set the pen with that or create a pen. We then bring in whichever color we're passing in and the colors are always going to be in this format where they have, they have a list. They have a dictionary. They have a dictionary. A dictionary has um, two values, a key and a value, a key and a value, a key and a value. So this is a dictionary and we've got three things in our dictionary to, to choose from, red, green and blue. And then what, once I've um, created these red, green and blue things with the values, I then want to create the pens themselves and have those stored. So black equals create pen display black, green is create pen display green and so on. So we've got those th uh, five pens to be able to use in our code later on. And I want to just define the length of our line as being whatever the width of the um, the display is, divide that by two. And that means we can get a nice uh, sweep around the full width of the display. And that the middle is the, the width of the display divided by two. And again, the reason I'm using these double slashes is if you, let me go down here and show you this. If I have a number, so let's say 240, let's do A equals 240. And then let's say uh, B equals 240 divided by three. Let's just do an awkward number. Let's look at B. So it's 80.0. Let's try five. See what B looks like then. I'm trying to find a, an unusual number. Let's do seven. Yeah, 70. There we go. So if I divide that by seven, for example, I get a floating point number 34.28571. Now that's not good if we're using a pixel display. We want absolute uh, whole number values. So if I do double slash like this and I now check B, it'll be a whole number. It basically just gets rid of all the floating point parts and just has an integer. So it's a really nice way to just deal with integers. So that's why I use the double slashes there. We're setting our current angle to be zero. So it'll be, we're sweeping from 180, throughout 180 degrees, starting at zero with zero being flat. But remember our servo is slightly different to that. So we'll have to add 90 degrees to whatever our servo is currently uh, working at. But I've also included here just in text, just to remind you what we're shooting for. So we need to solve an AAS triangle. Um, the angle of C is 90 degrees. Oops, 90 degrees. We know what the angle A is because we're going to pass that in. And we know the length of side C because that's going to be our length, our 100 pixels. Or if we've set it before, I think we said it was the, the width display divided by 2. And what we're going to do now then is just find what the angle B is. And then that means we can then work out the length of A and B, lowercase. So here's the formula for doing that. So capital A, that one is our main angle. We know what that is. That's what we're going to pass through the loop, 180 degrees. C is always going to be 90. So B is 180 minus C minus uh, whatever our current angle is. And therefore we'll be able to calculate what that B is at the top there. The length of C we know is our length. So to work out uh, lowercase a and b, we just need to use that um, c sin a and divided by c, uh, c, uh, sin c. And um, because they're in radians, we just have to put them in that radians uh, wrapper as well. So there you go. And then to work out what x1, y1 is, so x1 is the middle of our display minus b. So if, if our display is like here, the very middle point of that, we want to use that as an offset and have b minus that so that it's in the correct place uh, because we're using the, uh, we're sweeping, <laughs> I'm trying to sort of describe this with my hands. If my display is like that, where my thumbs touch is the middle point, our line is sweeping from that very middle point around 180 degrees. 
the Y one is whatever the height. Um, we just have to take off one pixel because display start at zero, not one. So we just need to take off whatever the height is, minus one to that. And then we minus A, which is the, the angle that we worked out. Sorry, the side that we worked out before, which is this height here. So there we go. So Y is always a height. X is always like a length. And we know that X2 is the middle between my two thumbs there of our display and the the y2 is the height minus one so the height of the display just minus one pixel there okay so then we can return x1 y1 x2 and y2 from our little calculate vectors thing and then we can do some stuff with our display so we can say angle equals one the direction is true because i want it to uh, sweep round and sweep back i found that if i didn't sweep back nicely the server would just go Zip! All the way back to zero and that would cause a spike on the pico and it would just re reboot the pico so that's why i've got this direction thing which is just is it going forwards or is it going backwards that's that's really all direction does so we set our servo to whatever the current a value is so a is currently one so our, our um, servo should be set to one degree and then we set the distance equals to the whatever the rangefinder distance is currently so our, is our rangefinder and then we say if I've got three bits of code here and they're just going to check if our angle is greater than one or two and this is how we get that trailing edge so when we sweep around with our radar we want it to leave behind some pixels so it looks like it's sort of fading so we need to do that with a couple of different colors so I've got really really dark green and dark green and then the main piece of code is our light green one down here and what we're going to do is we're going to overwrite um, we're going to draw a line and then we're going to overwrite it um, with the length of the distance that we're detecting. So if we draw a solid white line and then we overwrite that with the distance from the very bottom to the top of the object that's in front of us, we can then basically erase that and just have that top bit be the really bright bit, which is where in our sweep we've detected what we're looking for. So these three pieces of code basically just do the same thing. They just say if A is greater than one or A is greater than two or A is equal greater than three, we can then basically just um, offset the sweep that we're going around. So X1, Y1, X2, Y2 equals calculate vectors. We pass in the angle that we want to sweep round. I put in here plus 90 um, simply because we're using a servo as well. And I just wanted, I might take this out, but essentially that's just whichever angle you could have that just as A, to be honest. It's probably better to do that, actually. Like so. Um, minus one just means whatever the current angle is, just go back one angle and then draw a really dark line on there. And that's a way of kind of erasing what we've currently done on our display. Because uh, our display will stay there and, we, and it's additive. Whatever you draw on it, uh, any graphics operations you do, they are additive. Um, so I just need to remember to break for part three in a second, Alex. So I shall do that after this one. Um, so that's what A1, um, A greater than one, A greater than two does. They basically just erase the sweep. And I had another one there for A uh, greater than three and that would just erase everything and you wouldn't have any sort of sweep left over there. And then this is the main one that actually draws the uh, the, the bright um, thing on the screen, the, the object that it's detecting. So we do the calculate vectors again. We can have our angle that we are looping around 180 degrees and I've actually set the length here to be 100 so I know before we said it was whatever the display divided by 2 but I found 100 work better we then set the pen color to be light green we set the we actually draw the line x1 y1 x2 y2 and it doesn't matter what the angle is or where you start from it always works correctly so that's nice and simple and then we can then work out what the scan length is so what I've done on here um, depending on how far we can scan and I found that if you have nothing in front of these range finders it thinks it can scan up to 120 centimeters away that's the absolute distance it thinks it can measure so if it can't find anything it returns um, one two zero zero millimeters so I want to be able to set that and calibrate our display so the length of the objects on the display are calibrated to a distance I choose and I might not want 120 because if I detect something say five centimeters away and it can do 120 it'll be like one or two pixels on our scan so we can actually calibrate how far our scan is searching so this this is what this scan length is it's just a way of um, scaling that so if the scan length is over 100 
just make the scan length to be 100 and then we print out what the scan length is and then we set the calculate the, uh, the vectors again based on that scan length we set the display to be green and then we draw the line finally after doing all those drawing operations we then call display update and that actually makes it appear on the display if we did display to update after every single graphic operation your display will flicker so it's best just to do this once every every loop round and your display won't flicker then and then i've got some code here depending on which direction the scan is going so i want it to go scan forward and scan back and that's mostly because the servo if it flips back it'll just reboot the pico so i'll just check to see is it over 90 degrees is it um less than 90 degrees all that kind of stuff because the server works in plus minus 90 rather than 0 to 180 so i just need to factor that in and that's why i had that plus 90 in the code up here which i can put back in now um, so there we go so the next step will be to get the display and the um, server working in unison so it actually works in the way that you probably expect it to um, but that's the code it's actually quite simple how many lines is that 120 lines of code very simple to do okay so i'm going to take another break here let me just go back to our keynote and we'll come back to the uh, the join discord in a second what i'm going to do is i'm just going to flip out um did i put a part three in there or part four no i didn't so i'm just going to grab you just have to bear with me you're not supposed to see this behind the scenes I'm just going to copy that and have a part of four. Um, so let me just duplicate that. Let's just have that as part four. There we go. And we can go back to our... You didn't see that. That didn't happen. So we'll just pause there for a second. Oops. Okay, so welcome back. This is part four. Um, we're just wrapping up uh, this part of the series. So let me just go on to... Um, we've just done the demo, we've had a look at the code and the previous one. If you've not seen that video, just uh, jump back in the series and have a look at that one. And if you've not joined our Discord server, you're missing out massively. You want to go over to kevsrobots.com slash Discord. It's completely free to join and uh, you can have the com deeper conversation with us. And I'll be spending a bit more time hanging out with people through the week. And if anybody has any problems, you can ask questions there as well. You can also follow me on social media. So um, I'm on... Um, uh, Instagram as Kevin McAleer. I'm on Twitter. I'm still on Twitter as Kev's Mac. I'm going to see how Twitter goes. I'm also on uh, Mastodon as well. I think I'm just on uh, Kevin McAleer at uh, uh, Mastodon Social, I think, on that one. Um, I'll have a look, but I've not really posted very much on there at the moment. It seems to be quite uh, buggy at the moment, as in it crashes quite a bit. Uh, I am also on TikTok, so I've not put my TikTok uh, thing on this particular thing, but you can see down here on the side where I am, just below me, Kevin McAleer 6 on TikTok. I did a video on TikTok. It was this robot that we've just been looking at today, uh, the the Ultrasonic Ranger Finder one. Uh, Alex has just put a link in the, the chat there. And um, let me bring that one up, actually, just so you can, you can see it. I'll include this in the video description as well, actually. Uh, but you can check out this particular one. It's had like over 46,000 views, I believe, at the moment. Is that what it's on? Yep. So it's doing ridiculously well for a robot video. Uh, but I think we figured out how to do these and make these popular. Just good for a bit of fun and growing the channel. Okay, and... Um, if you want to help the channel out, which a growing number of people are doing, which really, really helps support the channel, you can do a super thanks. So next to the join button, hint on the uh, uh, YouTube play, there's a super thanks button. If you're watching live now in chat, you can, uh, watching on the live stream that is, you can um, hit the super chat button super thanks button super chat button super chat button <laughs> if you're watching on this live on the live stream and uh, again that helps um, helps out the channel and you get a special call out as well for that and you can go over to kezrobots.com slash coffee if you want to buy me a coffee as well which quite a few people have done recently so thank you very much for that you'll get a shout out in a second and if you want to join the membership program which a growing number of people have as well uh, you can also join the youtube membership as well Okay, so let me just go to the next piece, which is our supporters. Yes, I've got a special button I press for that. So here are our supporters. Uh, these are all people who have uh, very have been very generous um, in supporting the channel by buying me a coffee. So you can see we've got Frank there, we've got uh, Dana Huff, we've got uh, Grumpy Scrambler, we've got David, we've got Matt Hungerford, we've got Flavie of Dev, and we've got Patrick. 
then we've got a number of uh, members as well on the Buy Me A Coffee membership programme. Um, so we've got Chemi, he's, uh, I think he's on a gold programme at the moment. Shemi. So that's Chemi. 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 I keep saying it wrong. Thank you, Alex. Chemi. Uh, we've got Steve and we have Thomas as well, one of our longest uh, subscribers and supporters. And then we have a growing number of YouTube members. So, um, Michael, I think you joined recently. We've got Bill, we have um, Jose, we have Jeff, we have Johan, and we have uh, Jean-Paul and Tom. Cool. So if you want to get your names on here, you need to head over to um, kevsrobots.com slash uh, credits, and you can, you can do that. Okay. And that's it for the show today on the... Uh, the replay version of the show. So if you're watching this um, on replay, uh, this is the point in the video where I'll say thank you so much for watching. I hope you've enjoyed this part of the, the video and the other three parts as well. And I shall see you next time. And if you're watching this live, let's have a bit of a chat and see how things are going. So I saw there was a couple of questions earlier on. I know Richard posed one. Where was it? Let me just find it. Da, da, da. I'm just going to scroll up to the top there. Quite a few comments going on here. This is good. And let's, I'm nearly at the top now. <laughs> There's been a lot of comments. Here we go. Okay. Yeah, so a bit of chat about TikTok there. So I thought we'd just try out TikTok just to see um, what people thought of that. Um, people who might not normally come into contact with our channel. Um, I had a really, really interesting chat uh, on Friday um, with Chris Barnett from uh, explainingcomputers.com. And uh, he was saying one of the things that might be harming my channel is that I do live streams like an hour plus. And people, when they're viewing YouTube, will see the length of duration of a video and think, I'll probably pass on that because that's quite a big time commitment to look at. So by slicing them up into sort of 15 or minute. 15 minutes, between 12 and 18 minutes apparently is one of the golden time periods that people like to watch videos and consume them. They can watch them, they can binge them or they can watch them whenever they like. Thanks Hans, thank you so much for that. You've had a super chat there. I really appreciate that. And uh, yeah, thanks for explaining Pico Graphics. No problem at all. It's a really good graphics library. If you head over to github slash, um, github.com slash pimroni slash uh, Pimroni-Pico, they've got a whole section there on all the different things that you can do with uh, Pico graphics, but it's a really good graphics library. They put a lot of effort into that and it makes it really easy to do things like even displaying a JPEG or a GIF, an animated GIF, you can do all that. They use it for these um, um, galactic unicorns as well. I think they use the Pico graphics library as well. Got three of them, or is it that one just there as well? <laughs> I've actually got four of them. I've got another one to go. So, hey, Steve, how are you doing? I've got uh, Steve Rayner from uh, the UK there. Uh, I've got Hans. Thank you, Hans, for the, the super chat there. And uh, <laughs> Adam says, isn't Sokotoa a volcano? <laughs> it probably is as well. <laughs> I was never great at maths when I was at school. I think I just, I'd, I've clearly been off sick or ill one particular day of maths. And then from that point on, my maths was stunted. But I'm a smart person. I know how to do algorithms. I basically just needed to uh, to know how to basically get stuff done. Um, so Steve was asking, which 3D modeling tool do I use? So I use Fusion 360. Um, I started with the educational and hobbyist license, which is completely free. Uh, they have handicapped it very slightly. There's a few things that they um, like. You can only have 10 things open at a time and you have to manually choose which 10 things you can open at once. Um, and they've done that on purpose just to try and drive you towards the full paid version. And because people have supported the show so much, I've been able to afford the full um, full license. So I pay for that once per year. It's about £400 or something. But I use Fusion 360 a lot. So I'm constantly designing something such as this uh, cloud thing, which is um, it's got some mounting things for a Pico. So we can shove a Pico on there. Got some nice M3 screws, M2 screws, in fact, on there. And we can just... A little cloud computer thing going on there and things like this uh this thing i made uh this week just to put the the rangefinder robot thing together on uh, th there's all kinds of stuff i've made there i made this little stevenson screen as well for the um enviro uh, the pimeroni enviro so it's got um a space for the there it is just grab the uh, the thing so it's got one of these enviro indoor sensors and that has a battery pack as well. And basically that can go inside there with its battery pack, wherever that is. 
not bother to hand and then I can close this up and then just screw that little screw into that and it can just sat, sit somewhere taking readings sending them up to my MQTT broker so I use Fusion 360 a lot um, I think um, Laurie was asking that in the discord as well about um, do we have any good videos on uh, Fusion 360 so I learned um, by following Lars Christiansen he's got loads of really great videos on Fusion 360 so def uh, definitely recommend you check out his channel so Adam was saying X along the corridor Y up the stairs Z jump out the window <laughs> I like that. I'll remember that. We, we always had to have, like, is it left-handed and right-handed? There's like, if you're right-handed, you can uh, look at your coordinates like that. Z is straight up. Um, X is that way. Y is that way. I don't know. There was something like that. When we were doing 3D graphics, it was a long time ago. Um, so, which said, if you mean for designing parts, he hasn't said, but normally uses the same, which is Fusion 360. It's Autodesk Fusion 360. Works on Windows, Macs. Don't think it works on Linux. Um, but it's a really, really professional tool. What I like about it is you can do constraints. So you can say, here is a two-dimensional drawing and you can lock in certain coordinates, or uh, certain restrictions, like this line is locked to this line and it'll follow it around. It's a really, at first it's, it's a bit complicated because you'll do something it'll say, this is over constrained and you'll think, I don't understand what's going on, but you can do all really clever constraints with it. You can have tangent constraints. If you're drawing like a circle, you don't have to worry what the actual dimensions of the circle are. You can just lock it to like a, you know, a bottom and a side and it'll figure out the rest. It's really, really good. Um, so Richard says, if you just joined, why not say hi? Absolutely. Click the, click the thumbs up button. <laughs> cool, cool. So yeah, Adam and Richard are some of our longest viewers on here as well, I think. And uh, Alex, uh, Jimmy, yes, doing tons better this week. So you, you had a call, didn't you, last week? Yes. Yeah, but you, you have tons better this week. And uh, Jersey IT guy, Rory says uh, it was a cro it was cross, it was X is across literally and Y in the sky for me. Ah, I see X is across and Y in the sky. And it says X along the board, Y up the ladder. That's it. Yeah, captive nuts. They they are just the best thing. <laughs> they're basically just the best thing for securing things. So I uh, I use them quite a lot on a lot of these robot builds, just because they're a really good way of securing things together. Uh, I do use things like on this one. I've got some really small M2 screws going into some um, um, standoffs. That works quite well as well. Um, and they're really easy to print and design because it's just like a three millimeter hole. And 3D printers and if you if you design on Fusion 360, a three millimeter hole. You put a three millimeter nut, uh, three millimeter bolt or screw through that. The three D print will be ever so slightly thinner than that, so you get a bit of grip, and it'll basically just tap the the uh, the plastic and hold it in, probably without even nut on the back. But if you want it to be really secure, and you've taken it apart and put it back together a few times, you probably won't have that nut there. So captive nuts are really good. And Adam's agreeing there, SG90 is a little bit flaky is an understatement. So I've had quite a few of these burn out on me. They're really cheaply made. I mean, this one, all the sticks are peeling off and everything, but um, they're cheap and they do work. I built quite a few little robots with this, I think. Is it um, just next to the, the head there? You can't see it there. That's one of the, the robots that I built, which is a little cat robot. And you can see just next to the head on that side just there, that's the Robot Bunny robot, which also uses, uh, I think they're the DS929MG motors, servos, which are really good quality. We can't get hold of them at the moment, so I bought these Tower Pro ones from PyHut. So I've got, I think I've got four of them. I always think, why buy one when you can buy four? <laughs> I apply that all the time. Uh, great stuff. Yeah, Steve says he just bought two of those as well. Cool, cool. Um, what else we got? Yeah, really handy. Um, what else? We, so Alex was just talking about the live streams. So yeah, we're just going to try out this breaking up. So I've recorded the whole thing. It's going to be like the whole hour and a half, whatever it is normally. And then tomorrow I will edit that down. So I'm going to basically cut off the countdown timer and then cut the video to the end of the very first part. And I record these to disk as well disk to solid state storage on my Mac and I can basically just upload that second part as a separate brand new video um, and then the other parts will then be in a series I can add them to a playlist have them so that they have cards and they point to each other in the sequence and uh, yeah that means it'll it'll just hopefully work a bit better from the algorithm's point of view uh, there we go <laughs> The haunted clock is getting a mention there in the chat as well. Still there, we've still got the haunted clock. It's basically just just there. 
I think we're going to use this for a, a, a Christmas project, perhaps. So Steve was saying the labels are mixed up, Echo and Ground. So let me grab, let me grab the actual robot itself, and let's have a look. Let's see what it says. Let's grab this up here. So if I just hold this up here, you can see they've got the ground, echo, trigger and voltage. So the voltage and the ground are on opposite sides and the echo and the trigger in the middle. Now on the diagram, I had it that way forward so that you can see the voltage, trigger, echo and ground are in that orientation. And this is one of them that has the, you can see there it's got some writing there that says echo TX SDA. So the echo is also a transmit and it is the, uh, the, the system data and then we have the trigger, which is RX and SCL, which is the system clock. Uh, it can be UART as well. And then at the very bottom there, you can see it says R4 and R5. If you change them, you can make it I squared C or you can make it a UART. So I'm basically just using it as a low power ultrasonic rangefinder that works at 3.3 volts. So there we go. And Richard says, so in between each part of the live stream, uh, put in the little bits about liking, subscribing, and buy me a coffee. Yeah, so I'm thinking about I'll slice that section off, and I will I will have to do a bit of editing tomorrow evening, I think. Uh, but yeah, that's essentially what I'm going to have to do. I don't want to miss those bits off, but um, I'll just keep them really quick, I think. Uh, what else? So yeah, so it was a bit of a last minute change. I'd I'd not really designed the the live stream today to be done in that way, but um, we're going to give it a go. I'm going to see if it works because Chris says, and he kind of knows what he's talking about. He's a uh, uh, a YouTube Creator Academy tutor, I believe, as well, as well as having like nearly a million subscribers himself. And I think he's been doing this as long as YouTube has been about. He's got a video on his channel that's about 14 years old. And check it out. He's been amazingly consistent with his videos as well. Um, it's pretty much the same format, same graphics, same music and everything. Um, yeah, thanks, Alex. Put a link in the chat to his channel. So Roy says... Um, you could do with though. Here's one I unprepared earlier, <laughs> but love the real time nature of the broadcast. It's the same issues I always make up. Um, I always have, and it makes me happy. It's not just me with the struggles, like with Dupont cables. Exactly. So this is it. This is why I do this. There's an authenticity there. I think I usually drop something on every single video. I think I did pick something up and something else dropped, but uh, I didn't drop my actual thing that I was holding. So that's that's a win for me. There we go. Here's one I prepared earlier. So Dan didn't know about the double slash. There you go. You always learn something you see of my videos. It's worth hanging out for the full hour just to learn something like that, isn't it? <laughs> so Carsten says, um, uh, Rory, are you comparing him to Martha Stewart? <laughs> Is that a good thing? Didn't Martha Stewart go get um, put inside prison for doing some kind of fraud or something? I hope I'm not slandering her there. Libeler. Slanderer. Yep. Um, anyway, uh, so Richard says, uh, can, I, can I assume um, that you could make it so the display when an object is detected, the line after that point could be different color, red? Absolutely, yes. So we're going to draw a line. So what we would do is we would draw a red line and then we'll overwrite that red line with a like the green line, for example, so that when you see the final thing, it just looks like there's a red line stuck at the top compared to all the rest of it. So that's how we would do it. We can do it as a, a sequence. Um, so there we go. And laughing at that. Frack, I missed it. <laughs> you can always go back and rewatch the Odell, it's not a problem. Um, I'm glad you're hanging out with Odell, it's good to see you here. Uh, and what else have we got here? So now let's just put another link up to the TikTok. You've got to check it out, it's just a silly video, but um, it's just the number of views it's had is ridiculous. Compared to the rest of the videos I have on the channel, on the TikTok channel, they all get like a hundred views or something. And then there's this one with like 46,000 views. And we reckon that's for a number of reasons. One, we picked a popular song that's trending right now, which is that uh, Megan Trainer Made You Look. And that's relevant to the video because it's about looking using radar range finders. We use that uh, robot AI text to speech voice as well. Jesse, I think she's called. Uh, that draws people in. That has a familiarity on TikTok. So people have heard that before. It seems like a, a regular TikTok video and it's quite short as well. And it cuts quite fast. So I think that's the three reasons it did really well. But uh, Dale does not care for TikTok. I can understand this. Um, one of the things I've struggled with as well is shorts. YouTube shorts is now how people find your content. So that means that we have to do shorts and they're really difficult to do well because if my show is like an hour and a half long, how would you condense that down into 15 seconds of something of value? It's really difficult to do. So uh, Alvin says, oh, I missed it. You can go and rewind, it's fine. 
will be waiting for you. So Dale's internet sucking as well. And that, that's where Hans did the super chat. Thank you so much for that. Uh, Adam says, hello. Uh, hello, Dale. You're not alone here. And uh, Dan says, I like the idea of splitting the videos up into multiple parts. It definitely helps people like me who have 10 minutes here and 10 minutes there between chores. Absolutely, yes. Yeah. So we're going to try this and see how this works. Um, and we might still do this on a Sunday where we do the full live stream in one take and then we just split that up throughout the week. So you might see duplicate. Because I have seen some channels like... Um, What's the one? I watched one called Plainly Difficult, which is always like about disasters and stuff. I don't know why I like that, but I like watching those ones. And he does like an omnibus at the end of the year and he basically just gets all these videos back to back in one big edit. Um, so if you've seen them before, you've basically got duplicate stuff on the channel. So it's kind of like doing that, but um, in reverse, really filming the whole thing and then slicing it up. So Rory says, um, uh, ever ever thought about speeding up the build by combining laser cut and 3d printing so i need a laser cutter that's what i need for the studio we are thinking about getting one it's just kind of where to put it so um this is about three by four meter space there's quite a lot of space in the middle here um but on each wall there is just basically desk space so unless we get rid of alex's chair which i really don't want to do because where would alex go um we might have to have some kind of small laser cutter that we can just put up and i would have to it's a wooden structure so i would have to make sure i watch that like a hawk uh, because i know that there can be fires with laser cutters um my friend simon monk who does monk makes he had a bit of a fire with his laser cutter a while back and it's it looks a mess but he did it in a building that was you know like a brick building so there's no issues there but yes um yeah so uh, robert says uh, your base would have been three millimeters um would have been minimum of um cut at three millimeters mdf yeah it's a good thought that but uh yeah you might want to check out that um that explorer build that, you know the chassis and using that as a design it really works well so if i just grab my robot there it's the exact same chassis um you can see on this one here we've got the motor holders in place and the n20 motors but i've currently not got them soldered in place yet so these are just here waiting for me to do the last bit which is putting these little motor drivers on on this back piece here and also somewhere to put the, the battery so i've got a whole bunch of bits and pieces on here um, to do that i just grab these bags here got my kimoni bits and pieces so i've got the uh, amigo pro the lipo amigo pro which is really great for doing um, from lipo batteries to um, devices so you can charge your lipo battery and you can also just send out five volts which is what we need for the servo um, got a number of picos with um, the header pins on and I've got another couple of those uh, pico lipos and then what else have we got there pico lipo shim so this pico lipo shim is really great for uh, taking um, motors oh sorry taking um, a battery and connecting it through and powering it that way but if i'm using the pico uh, amigo the lipo amigo pro instead i don't need to use it. i just need one of those and like a gallium battery which i've probably got somewhere hanging about but you've seen those gallium batteries before probably have one on here somewhere but yeah they're a small battery a small lipo battery 3.7 and it'll it'll upscale that to five volts before you move on, did mm -hmm. you catch the comment from dan makes things in between the stand oh did i not it got deleted by accident i don't know if you can uh, see it. there you go that one did you read that one wrong? yes yeah yeah, yeah. yeah. Thanks for that, Alex. Good, good. Um, hey, Todd, how's it going? I've uh, not seen you on here before, so good to meet you. And what else have we got? Da, da, da. So, plus one for Lars, absolutely. So Lars Christensen, absolutely great YouTuber and very knowledgeable about Fusion 360. I think I learned everything I know about fusion 360 by watching him and just doing stuff um i would basically just sit down and i would try and make something in fusion 360 so for example i just set myself little challenges like um recognize which film this is from it's a little telepod a little teleporter thing that's a really complicated design <laughs> to design in fusion 360 it's got all different types of elements so there's like a, a circular pattern there of little fins there's like it's got a curvature uh, there's different bits that stick out these fins that are on here it's also quite a difficult object to 3d print as well and then you've got these different fins on the bottom it's even got three holes so i've got a bottom piece that you can screw in there with two m screw two m screws and it's the same dimensions as this thing so you can basically just put this uh this thing into it 
which is the Pimeroni Enviro Indoor. So the idea is that that could sort of just live inside there. So I just try every now and again when I have a moment, just try and, and stretch my knowledge of Fusion 360 and do something else with that. So Todd's watching from Kansas. Awesome. Uh, let's have a look what else we've got. There's a good course on Udemy as well, Dan says, um, for, for Fusion 360, incredibly detailed. Yeah, they probably lay it out really well. The, the thing with the Lars ones, I wasn't, I kind of just dipped in and out and found ones that I was trying to solve a particular problem and he had like a, this is how you do that. Or if I liked the design of the thing he was making, I would just go and see how he made that. So yes, it's quite a different style than say something like SketchUp or FreeCAD. But um, it's, it's definitely worth learning. I think it's the best tool that there is. Great. We've got a super chat from uh, Mrs. Brent, my auntie. Thank you for that, Auntie Marlene. That's a really good. Great show. Thank you. Good, good. So um, thank you very much indeed for that. So Adam says uh, open SCAD uh, can also be used for 3D modeling. Yep, that's pretty good. Hey, Brad Wilson, how are you doing? Um, so do you stream at a regular time? So I live stream every single Sunday at seven o'clock uh, Greenwich Mean Time. I do try and get a midweek video out as well. Got new subscribers there, Acra, Acra Hood. Thanks for joining. So yes, I, I do live stream every single Sunday, seven o'clock GMT. I try and get a, a midweek video if I have time, usually around Wednesday. So it could be Tuesday, it could be Friday. <laughs> try and get it for Wednesday. Again, it's just if I have enough time to do that. Um, if I've designed any more parts for this robot, such as this back piece with the, the battery on and the power management and stuff, I will, I'll do a midweek video on that. And that could be like part five of this video series. Um, so there you go. So Dale says, I had my alarm set one hour too early. It's probably because we, it's some of the daylight savings times has changed. In the UK, we changed, uh, was it last week? And then... Is it last week? You said daylight savings time. There's been a discussion about me saying daylight savings time. There you go. Time. So daylight savings. We call it British summer time, but obviously the rest of the world calls it daylight savings time. Oh. And you do it at different times. What? No, that was the, that was the conversation. Is it? Ah. I see. But it's at different times. It's about two weeks different. So there we go. Uh, yes. So Adam says, I've got a few dead ones. Uh, Rory says, I've been trying FreeCAD um, and some lovely features like variables. Great for three and four millimeter laser cutting, but Fusion 360 is just better. Worth it if you can afford it. Buy cheap, buy twice. Yeah, you can do you can do variables in Fusion 360 as well. I shall load it up and I shall show you the model I've just been working on and how you can use variables in there. It's really nice. Um, so yeah, we're just talking about daylight savings. You can see there in the chat. Um, agree, but I've also used Open SCAD. Um, so. Dan says, are you doing this full time now? Nope, I have a full time day job, Monday to Friday. I just try and squeeze this in as well. But I basically give every single moment that I'm not doing my full time day job. I'm doing something to do with robots and the channel. I would love this to be my career, but um, the income just is nowhere near like enough to cover. Even like my mortgage at the moment is just not enough. Um, there we go. So let's have a look at... So Adam's saying, tut, 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 UK doesn't have daylight savings. That's an American thing. So we have British summertime. It's the same thing. It's an hour shift um, arbitrarily at two o'clock in the morning. One day you just go spring forward or fall back is the way I remember it. Fall, that's an American term as well. But that's what we use for it remember it. Did you yeah. watch it change? We were in the kitchen, we saw it. Yeah. Right. So I've got my other screen over here, um, Fusion 360. So there's this little FX button over here. If we click that, we can add in uh, variables. So if we if we said um, I don't know hole, and we say that that is two millimeters, we've got the unit there is two. I can click OK, and then if I just create a sketch on here create it on there if I do C for circle I hover over that little bit there see how it changes to like a little square that's that means it's like locked in place and now it's looking for a dimension so if I just type in hole you can see there now that oops I didn't actually select I'm going to do D for dimension in fact I'm just going to double click in that thing there and just type in hole like so okay so our hole now is if I scroll into that there we go it's two 
millimeters in size, which is absolutely tiny on this uh, zoom level. There we go, we can just about see it now. So there we go, so if we go back into that uh, parameters thing, we can change that and make it like five millimeters and then click OK. And we can now see that that's changed. And if you wanted to have like another one in the middle, for example, you can say D for dimension and you can say whole divided by two and it'll be half of the whole. You can do all that kind of stuff. You can also do things, if I do L for line, if I have a line over here, line over here, line over here, or a line over here. See how that line's a little bit wonky? I can straighten it up with this uh, vertical horizontal thing. Um, if I click on here, I can then do like a, a tangent to this this uh, circle, and that's now locked in place, so I can move this around, but it will always, because of that little tangent constraint, will always be connected to that. So you can do things like um, just make all of these tangent to the circle. Let me just do that again, click on that and then that. Click on that and then that. Click on that and then that. And then now I can basically just stretch these lines out. And as that little circle there touches that, see how it's got that little square that appears? That means it's now locked in place. And there's now like a constraint there. See these little constraints there? They are these coincident constraints. So you can basically build up your, your object just by using these constraints. They're really, really powerful things. So if I do this, let me just finish this off and I'll show you why they're powerful. So I'm just going to connect that one up there. I'm going to do the last one down and then this one across here. Lock that in place. If I go back into my um, my parameters thing and I change this now to four and I go OK, everything because it's using constraints and variables has resized correctly. I don't need to do anything else. Everything's like locked in place. Now it might be that I want to make this outside box. If I double click, it will chain select everything that it touches. And if I press X, it'll make it like a, a line type. It's now a construction line. So you can't see that when you're, if I finish the sketch and I zoom in on that and I do like E to extrude, oops. I think I just made that slip away then if I just zoom back in there there we go and I just pull this up again I can type in I could do whole times two and then we get whatever that is and then we've got like a part going on absolutely love it and very very quick to do things like you know if you want to do a, a chamfer on there you can just say how many um, was that a chamfer that was a fillet a chamfer is like more angular, isn't it? A fillet's a lot round. Um, yeah, you can do all kinds of stuff like that. It's, it's like a bullet, yeah. And if you wanted to um, have a number of bullets rep, you know, repeated, you can basically just do like a circular pattern. The reason it's jumping in and out like that is just because of the software that I'm using. It's trying to keep everything on the screen, and if something slightly goes outside that screen bounds, it, it sort of resizes it. Uh, right, so if I just click on that there, and then it will say, what's the axis you want to spin this around? I mean, this isn't really going to work without me having a different axis. Let's just go back into the sketch and then let's just do like a little thing off to the side here. And then let's just bring that sketch back. And let's just extrude this up a little bit just so we've got something to, to repeat round right for. And I now do a circular pattern. I grab that body there. I grab the axis as being the middle part there. I can then say with this little control thing, how many of these objects I want round. So you can basically just like, you know, have 12 objects round, something like that. And there you go. How cool is that? You can turn off your little sketches and then you can do things like render out um, a really nice rendition of this in like photorealistic. Generative design is for solving problems. Basically, just give it what the problem is and it will work out different designs based on the uh, limitations you provide. You can do animations. I've used that on that thing this this uh, today where the rangefinder was moving around. I basically just created a joint and had the parts move and you can animate the joints. You can simulate things. This is using um, finite element analysis, which is like a really clever way of working out the structure of things and how they're going to stress and bend and stuff like that. There's all kinds of rules of thumb for different materials have got different properties and you can factor all that in. Manufacturing, you can have like additive or what's the other one? <laughs> you take stuff away, um, different manufacturing process. So if you're using like a, a mill bit and you're taking away a material, 
it will do all the paths for you for that. If you're doing a 3D print thing, you can basically just click in here and say, save that particular body there as a mesh. And then you can get this mesh over here. You can save it as an STL. And then you can just send that to like, you know, Cura or something like whatever you use for your doing your STLs to G code. So yeah, really, really powerful things. You can join all these together as well if they're, uh, if they're different parts, just by grabbing them and using like this uh, combine tool. Let's grab all them, get rid of them. And uh, the last one I'll show you if I just do another sketch on here. So if I wanted to make like a Smiles robot, I just remember these like religiously, the dimensions of this. If I go uh, 70 by uh, 52, I think it is. If I just end that sketch, let's just show the sketch. And let's extrude that out by 32. And then a Smiles robot has got some nice fillets around the edge. So it's got four, I just push there. And then there, they're all four. And let's just grab each of these edges like so. And then we have a shell. So we have like a two or three millimeter shell like so. And you basically just can create an object very quickly doing that. So it looks like the one that Laurie created. She did like a nice um, storage box with um, some screw things in. And then you can use these new surfaces to create new sketches on as well. So. You can use them to do further stuff. So yeah, I love Fusion 360, it's really, really powerful. Okay, so let's have a look what else people are talking about. Uh, so Lois says, uh, yeah, Martha went to, to prison for insider trading on the stock market, I did not know that. I knew it was something to do with uh, money, but well, I didn't know it was insider trading, interesting. So, um, oh, Chris has got a really nice voice. He's, uh, he's very good, I, I love what he does. Uh, so Dale says, uh, it's not proper stream until Kevin drops something. It's so true. Absolutely. So Laurie says, I believe she got in trouble in prison for hide, uh, for trying to hide spices, making food nicer. <laughs> yeah. Rich says, Chris reminds me of TVs from the 80s. I like him. Absolutely. I love his, uh, his style of presenting stuff. Uh, so Adam says, uh, again, garbage is American, rubbish is English. You say potato. <laughs> You say potato, I say potato. Tomato. Tomato, tomato. <laughs> I, I like, well, there's some comedian talking about that, about how like American language is quite, quite straightforward. Like, like it's, we have pavement in the UK. In America, you have sidewalk. It's where you walk and it's on the side of the road. It's like really descriptive. And um, the, the eyeglasses, that's right. And then the other thing was horseback riding. <laughs> How else would you ride a horse like hanging underneath or something? Yeah, there's a really funny uh, video if you search that on YouTube about somebody talking about horseback riding and pavements and so on. Can't remember who does it, but yeah. Uh, Adam says, Rich, I agree. It's kind of like a how it's made video. Uh, I had to explain to judge in. I had to explain to a judge in. Okay. Um, he's redone that one. Ah, I see. So. Todd says, I prefer long videos. I in the, am I in the minority? So apparently so. Apparently it's harming my channel's growth that I'm not doing much shorter videos because mine tend to be quite long ones. The midweek ones are much shorter. And obviously I'm doing a few shorts as well. Um, but yeah, mine tend to be because they're like, I'm showing you how to do something. They are, tend to be a bit longer. So Richard says, uh, I had to explain to a judge in LA what snookered meant during a court case. Awesome. Yep, snookered. Uh, so Dale says, I need to get my 3D printer working. I need to design some adapters to control mount, uh, to mount control boards. Uh, says, I'm now up to 41 or 51 videos on my electronic kit, but they are all under four minutes each. How are you doing on that then? I shall have to check them out, Adam. Um, so it depends on the content. Something like this needs to be longer. I agree. I, th I think there's some things you could rush them, but let's try slicing them up and just see how that goes. This is still going to be there, but um, just as four separate pieces. So is it a build sequence? Uh, you can buy you can buy self-triggering fire extinguishers, which people should invest in for laser cutters. Absolutely. I have got a smoke alarm up there as well, just in case. We need a Pimeroni X Kevin McAleer project uh, with a build video. So I do do their intro videos. I need to record one for the uh, Galactic Unicorn they've launched recently. And there's a, a secret one as well that I think um, somebody teased recently. I don't think I've got it on here, have I? Um, I think G teased it the other day. 
I think it's in a box I'm actually. I'm not going to give it away. I'm going to show the box. <laughs> that's far cooler. Where's it gone? I had it here a moment ago. Ah uh, well, you'll just have to. Yeah, you'll probably have to not know what it is. But yes, yeah, a new Pimeroni product, which is really cool. So Adam says, uh, sort of following an instruction manual that isn't very instructional, but aimed at teaching kids electronics. Not a recommended purchase. Cool. So uh, Dale says I scored four Pico. Uh, I always get this wrong. Four LiPo Amigo Pros this time. I probably should have ordered more of them. Yeah, they, they were not available, were they, for quite a while? So that's why I ordered like a ton of them as well, because I think I use them in every project now. They're just really good. They just do the trick. And because they're based in the UK, it's really quick for me to get hold of them as well. I know um, Adafruit do like the Power Boost. They're quite good as well. Um, what else have we got on here? Da, 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 da. So Dale says I prefer at least 15 minutes for build sequences. There we go. And there's the super chat from my auntie. Thank you for that. Uh, so Dale says I still want to get a Galactic Unicorn, but I have to prioritise. I'm getting my Pimeroni order Tuesday and I'm waiting for some DigiKey stuff as well. Awesome. Um, so I've got these nice little kits of Amazon for $36. That That's all metal except the Mechanum wheels. Yeah, Mechanum wheels are very expensive, aren't they, for what they are? I was thinking about designing some 3D printable ones. The only thing I'm sort of toying with is how, what kind of metal um, inner shall I use? I could use like a paper clip or something, but yeah, I've not, not factored that one out yet. Leroy says, uh, hi Kevin, as a Linux user, I prefer Onshape to Fusion 360, but Onshape uh, have recently changed their free tier. Interesting, I've not used Onshape before. So they don't have a free tier for me because it's all very expensive. Yes, so. Yeah, for hobbyist stuff, I mean, you don't want to be investing like hundreds of pounds in a piece of software that you might occasionally use. That's, I think that's the issue, isn't it? Now, you can use things like Blender. I was watching, uh, is it Google Apps? There's like, um, it's a family. They do really cute videos on stuff. And uh, they did one um, recently and they use Blender to design some parts. And Blender is completely free. Um, I mean, it's not designed for for manufacturing if you like it's more designed for 3d graphics but you can use it to export S uh, stl files so why not so uh, adam says i bought a six degree of freedom metal arm off amazon but the servos were plastic and got destroyed order replacement metal gears uh, but the only output shaft was metal and the gears are shredded dough yeah that's really awful uh da -da -da -da. what else we've got on here so dale says Where's it gone? I'll not buy anything uh, made by a particular company. I'll not put it on screen. Adam says, um, I got stung twice by two separate sellers. Don't buy Metal Gear servos if the photo has any silver or grey output shafts. Yeah, so I don't think I've got any of those to hand, but uh, these Tower Pro ones, I mean, you pay your price for these. These are not cheap. They're probably about seven or eight pounds each, um, but you get what you pay for. They are properly, they, they feel hefty. Even the, the case is all metal, so good quality. Cool. So hopefully you get your Trilobot uh, replacement main board. Oh, fingers crossed. Um, I built a frame. A, I built a fame panel maker script using dimension for use with aluminium extrusion. Amazing how simple it was, uh, and it was also built on Open SCAD. Awesome. I definitely can recommend the kit I just built. Um, so Jim says uh, liking your content. Thanks, Jim. Really appreciate that. And you're new to the channel as well. Got David, he says hello from Belgium. Hey David, how's it going? And uh, Dale says uh, that's why I jumped at this kit. Only $36 for everything, and the Mechanum wheels are very solid. Exactly. So I think the Mechanum robot I've got is right at the back over there, right near that robot sign. You can't really see it. Uh, and that's got four, obviously, <laughs> Mechanum wheels on there, but they're, they're quite expensive, I think, to, to buy. But it's because each one of them has to have like a spindle and each wheel has got like about what 12 spindles on there so it does push up the price cool cool so let me just see if there's anything else on the chat there i think um i think that's pretty much it yeah dale says it's pretty it's worth spending more to get better servos completely agree with that cool Okay, so thank you so much for joining me on this. Really enjoyed this live stream. I think we've gone way over the time that we normally do. With, uh, we're nearly at uh, what's that, an hour 40 now. Uh, but I will slice these up and we'll see how that performs. Uh, and we can decide whether we want to carry on doing that format or doing the format we've, we've done to date. And just see if I can get a bit more, bit more faster growth on the channel. Because I'm putting a lot of effort into this and I want it to succeed. So um, anything that can help with that, all the better. 
cool cool adam says i've got some plastic mech wheels compatible with lego technic awesome so yes thank you very so much for watching i shall see you all next time bye for now